We've been discussing the U.S. pastoral letter by the U.S. bishops on racism, Open Wide Our Hearts, published in 2018. They begin their letter by saying, Holy Scripture boldly proclaims, See what love the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called children of God. Yet so we are. This love, they say, comes from God and unites us to God. Through this unifying process, it makes us a we which transcends our divisions and makes us one, until the in, the in the end, God is all in all. We don't even have to say that God is colorblind. A person's race, skin, color, or ethnicity mean nothing to God, nor do they mean anything to Jesus Christ, who died to save all human beings from the death of sin. Prejudice is a human invention arising from a we versus them mentality. Prejudice capitalizes on differences and can be as non-serious as sports rivalries or as serious as racial hatred. Prejudice and racism, say the bishops, come from a poisonous root that infects people who really have no reason to hate each other. The word prejudice means to judge something or someone before all the facts are revealed. It is a rush to judgment that can only lead to harm, anger, and ultimately to hatred. In their pastoral letter on racism, the bishops reflect on the prophet Micah's words from his sixth chapter. You have been told, O mortal, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, only to do justice, to love goodness, and to walk humbly with your God. In our last chat, we spoke about doing justice. If we are to be a nation that is just, say the bishops, we must be a society that recognizes and respects the legitimate rights of individuals and peoples. It follows then, that the citizens of any nation must love goodness, the second requirement that God has placed before us if we are to be God's people. This is not too much to ask. God created us with an innate appreciation of goodness and beauty. Human beings naturally tend toward goodness. There is an inborn sense of fair play within us. Competition begins when someone has something we want. In the early 80s, there was a quirky movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy, that for me is a good example of how the natural goodness of people can be compromised by jealousy and rivalry. A pilot of a small aircraft flying over some part of Africa finishes drinking a soda and tosses the empty bottle out of the window. It lands at the feet of a tribesman who is hunting in the bush. He picks up the bottle, inspects it, and figures it to be a gift from one of the gods who just flew over. He takes the bottle to his village and shows it to his friends. Now, this village represents a kind of childish innocence. Everyone there shares everything in common. In a way, there is no sin there. Everything is good, and the people live in harmony, that is, until the tribesman brings the bottle into the village. He is happy to share it, to pass it around for all to see. One person discovers that the bottle can make music if you blow into it. Another realizes that it's good for grinding grain. All is good with the new discovery until someone tries to take it away from someone who's using it. This leads to one hitting the other over the head with the bottle and it becomes a weapon. The man who introduced the bottle to the village decides that he must take it and return it to the gods and so begins a long trek to what he believes to be the end of the earth where the gods dwell. He loves goodness and therefore must dispose of the thing that has robbed his village of its own goodness and unity. So, what is goodness and how does it affect, or its lack, affect our attitude towards race? The bishops suggest that we check our attitudes toward others against the fruit of the Spirit, enumerated by St. Paul in Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These qualities are fruit, that is, the evidence of goodness that comes from our relationship with God and His Son, Jesus Christ. A person whose fruit is deep anger, impatience, or even hatred is not spiritually healthy. Racism, as we said earlier, is a poisonous root that can produce such fruit. Loving goodness is more than adherence to the idea or the concept of goodness. It must be made concrete by intentional actions. Loving goodness is a decision because love itself is a decision that transcends our emotions. Of the nine fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians, only two, 
joy and peace might be considered emotions. The rest, love, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, require decisive action. These qualities must be applied to our relations with others, beginning with the members of our family and, by extension, to persons of all races and backgrounds. Unless we make this application broadly, we run the risk of being prejudiced or even racist. The bishops write, Each of us should examine our conscience and ask if these fruits are really present in our attitudes about race, or, rather, do our attitudes reflect mistrust, impatience, anger, distress, discomfort, or rancor? We must not be discouraged if this self-examination reveals anger or other negative attitudes toward others. At least our consciences are properly indicating the areas of our lives that need work and forgiveness. The soda bottle I mentioned earlier was the instrument that revealed the hidden attitudes of jealousy and rivalry in that village. Such attitudes are facts of life in a sinful world, and we are all affected by these attitudes one way or the other. They are the shadow side of the good fruits of the Spirit. To love goodness is to allow God to remind us of the gifts that we have received from the Holy Spirit, gifts of grace that when called upon sincerely can enable us to see the goodness in others, to love that goodness, and to resist the prejudicial instincts that blind us to that goodness.